Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 79 of Interstellar Quest. We have been away for a couple of weeks while I was in Scotland, but now we are coming back. And of course, we're returning to uh, the basic everyday duties of running a space program. We have the Outland still flying around and exploring the moon. There are biomes left untouched, and it intends to explore them all. Today's destination is the Northern Basin, a depression near the North Pole of the Moon. The sample contains evidence of a weak, localised magnetic field. That's one small step for a Kerbal and one big cupboard full of snacks for the same Kerbal. Or at least that's what you'll get when you return to Kerbin, because right now we're down to about two weeks of life support and we need to finish up this survey. This far north, sunbathing is off the menu, because clearly we're at too high latitudes to uh, get a decent tan, right? Anyway, back in the construction business, we of course have some more fuel tanks to attach to our uh, interplanetary spacecraft. Uh, as you know, I've switched back to using conventional chemical rockets for the, much of this construction, because the space planes, while they're interesting, they simply can't carry the same capacity of hardware that we need. So we're throwing away hardware left, right and centre ditching it so that it falls back to the planet Kerbin. And yes, it's always quite nice to actually watch the falling back to see, to make sure that they finally die. But sir, we last left them on a re-entry trajectory. Surely they could not have survived. You presume too much, Commander. There is always the chance. You have failed me for the last time, Commander Ozzel. That's clearly how the Imperial Space Program works, right? <laughs> and off it goes. Nice, it practically tunneled into the surface. You know, we haven't done enough of exploring the core of Corbin, have we? We occasionally get there through glitches, though. So yeah, that is just another fuel tank that we have to add on the side. Rotation is incredibly important in this, because if it's slightly off-axis, then we will get some uh, we'll get some torque when we're firing that main engine. Although, to be fair, that main engine isn't going to be firing at 100% thrust. I figured that 100% thrust will give it about half a G, but it will be more efficient if I run it at maybe 20% thrust. Anyway, docking, we have a 270.3 degree orientation, which is close enough for me, only off by 0.3 of a degree. So there it is, beautiful hanging over the planet. We still need to add the habitation module and the lander. And, well, we need to start bringing up some space tape to hold this together. And that's the purpose of this next mission. So this is just a standard flyer that I threw together using a B9 fuselage parts. And, of course, the rapier engine, which I haven't used very much of on account of me being really fascinated by nuclear-powered engines. But it like, has a docking port in the front, RCS, a cargo bay, and uh, yeah, nice view from the interior. Now, let, this thing is booting up really slowly. I should probably have started the thing booting up before I... Okay, flight data, flight data, how do I see... Okay, I think I'm going to be running up at the end, edge of the runway soon. Where is the... Oh, wait! Oh! Okay. Yeah, so, uh, note to self, make sure that you boot up the flight computer before you actually start running out of runway. Nevertheless, off we go into space, like the proverbial space bat out of hell, although the space bat probably just got incinerated by the exhaust, but it's fun to imagine this space bat on the side of the space shuttle clinging on for life all the way into space. Yeah, the rapier engines are an absolute godsend to building, you know, lazy space planes. It's very easy to build a compact spacecraft which will go into space and come back and just require almost no management, no balancing of fuel types and things like that. Anyway, we have to rendezvous with the, the IP spacecraft so that we can actually start using our onboard equipment to prepare it for its long flight. The task has been given to Jebediah and Bill. Unfortunately, once again, I managed to make the docking actually happen on the dark side of the planet, so I've turned up the ambient light so we can actually see what's going on here. So, the place we're going to try docking is the little docking adapter on the side of one of those fuel tanks there, you see that? We decided to make this modular so that we could actually keep on attaching fuel tanks to the side, and... 
there we go. Open the fee, open the control thing. And once again, the OS is booting up. It seems that the OS is always booting up whenever I try to do anything. Okay, I don't actually need the flight data at this time anyway. So I'm going to try docking IVA mode, which uh, requires me to kind of slide down here. You're just looking at that IVA screen. There is an abort option, so you'd have to like push the down button or whatever five times and then hit the hit the actual initiate button to actually perform the abort. Seems a little uh, slow. If when you're uh, in a situation that requires an abort, generally you're not going to be flipping through computer menus to find the abort option. You want the big red abort button somewhere. So anyway, yeah, just uh, bringing this down and looking for the docking port. There we go. And then move forward until the force is felt, the force pulling us together and bringing us into a stable docking configuration. We are docked, we are mated, there we go. So now, now it is up to Bill, Bill the space engineer, to start applying space tape liberally over this structure here. See, it does look rather um, flexible at this time. Even with the enhanced uh, st you know, part strength that was added in 0.235, space tape, or also known as struts, is the way to go here. It's probably not going to be experiencing huge accelerations, as I said, because this is really designed for long thrust interplanetary travel. But uh, it will be nice to be able to rotate this thing without the thing flopping around like a wet noodle. Okay. Bill, 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 you are now on EVA, and let's make sure we open the command, the open the cargo bay for you. There we go. Uh, close cargo bay doors because we are still running with this hacked version of B9 that isn't officially supported. I've heard there may be an official updated B9 coming soon, but uh, it probably will be for 0.24, and I don't see me upgrading the Interstellar game to 0.24. The main reason I can't upgrade it to 0.24, incidentally, is because there is a, an incompatible change that was made with Infernal Robotics, which would basically break my entire saved game. And the old version of Infernal Robotics, I don't believe, is working for 0.24, so I can't upgrade my... I can't upgrade this game. So at this stage, I pretty much can't add mods, I can't fix mods, I uh, can't fix any bugs. This is going to be the end of the Interstellar program once, uh, once I get the warp drive running. Of course, once the warp drive is running, we can perhaps go and explore new systems in future uh, series, but Interstellar will be confined to version 0.235. Okay, so we've grabbed the strut from the container here. What we have to do, and you've seen this before if you've watched all of the episodes, you have to fly around to wherever you want to stick the thing, and then you right-click on the object that's on your back, attach it, and there it goes with a little bit of sound of a, a drill or something, or a, a screwdriver, which uh, they don't... You have to be very careful with the screwdrivers and stuff, the electric screwdrivers in space, because they will just as happily rotate you as they rotate the object. So when you're using these kind of power tools in space, they are actually very careful about uh, exactly how much torque they apply and making sure that the astronauts are secured and everything. So yeah, they, there's how you do it. You attach one and then the other and then you, you link them. So this becomes a very, very long process because you pretty much have to fly back and forth for every single part. It takes a long, long time, and you can see this is all at four times regular speed. You can see the planet Kerbin moving underneath us as if we're traveling at, say, nine kilometers per second, because that's what it would look like since we're traveling at four times, or since we're time accelerating. Anyway, this long, tedious process can be uh, changed into a slightly faster and far more entertaining process by instead picking up the actual container here and then I can take it over to where I'm using it. Uh, the only thing is, because there's no play way for me to actually secure it, then uh, it kind of floats around and will happily start to float away from the space station or the spacecraft as the tidal forces pull it away. You see, normally everything attached to a space station is wanting to go in its own orbit, but because it's attached, it kind of stays still. But if you have something sitting next to the station, then the tidal forces will pull that thing slowly onto its own orbit and it will inevitably drift away into space. So I have to, had to basically 
keep on uh, moving it back, keep on bringing it back to where I worked it, because it wouldn't sit down. Anyway, eventually, after a lot of tedious toing and froing, we are ready to return homewards. Now, the re-entry was pretty painless, except that what happened was, you'll notice that at this point, I'm trying to pitch up as hard as possible, and my nose is inevitably falling. And uh, I realise that this is a prototype vehicle, and once again, I don't have parachutes or an escape plan or anything. And I was starting to get a little bit concerned that this thing was just going to nosedive into the ground. And you see the pitch indicator is at 100% positive. We're dropping down past uh, 12 kilometers. We're moving at about 400 meters per second, and the velocity is dropping off. But all the same, my vertical speed is simply increasing uh, regardless of what I do. And I start to get very concerned that I'm going to hit the ground at about 100 meters per second and the aircraft will not survive. But then, of course, you have to realize that this is Ferrum Aerospace and it does model transonics, at least to a limited effect. And there, look at that. At some critical point, I go slow enough that the wing is able to grab onto the air and suddenly I get my control surfaces back. And so, yeah, it was pretty easy from that point on. I just had to have faith that the spacecraft would bring control back to me and I was able to put the aircraft down after a successful mission. Now, the next spacecraft or the next space mission I had queued up was the habitation module for the interplanetary spacecraft. You see that this is, uh, well, it's a composite spacecraft and it does suffer from a bit of wobbling. That's largely because there's quite a lot of torque. Uh, I wanted to have something that looked a bit different from the usual habitation, you know, crew cans and things like that. So I took a bunch of B9 parts and kind of strapped them together to create something flatter, something different looking, and of course something that actually, it would actually serve as a lifeboat as well because it has parachutes and it has an, an RCS uh, propulsion system so that we would be able to use this not just for the initial docking but should things get really bad we can actually use this as a lifeboat and land on any atmosphere atmospheric planet which would of course be Kerbin and uh, Lath because those are the ones that we're most likely to see given that I've pretty much decided that we are going to be taking this entire spacecraft to Joule. So now we're just above the atmosphere. We ditch the uh, the nose cone that was needed for the atmosphere. It will, of course, return and get a proper Viking funeral on its descent through the atmosphere. And then we go through our circularizing burn. Um, unfortunately, I actually designed this to be a two-stage spacecraft, but something, it didn't quite work and the, the stages were locked together. So instead, we took the whole thing up and now we get to ditch it. Now you'll notice the, the Apoaps periaps are different by about 17 kilometers. So the first thing I did was, was circularize this orbit by uh, more or less using the RCS engines to push towards the planet and reduce the eccentricity while keeping the actual semi-major axis above the target we're trying to rendezvous with. And because it's above, it means we're going slower and it will slowly catch up with us over the next few orbits. But uh, the rest of the spacecraft, of course, gets to return once again to an epic vi Viking funeral. Of course, I say this and I'm really perpetuating this myth. In truth, most Nordic seamen were actually uh, cremated on land because you know what? If you're trying to cremate a body, it's better to do it somewhere which isn't surrounded by water. Anyway, free from its earthly possessions, the spacecraft... Uh, well, it's finally ready to get going into orbit, and at this point, Shurhat and Jurhat Kerman realized that they were sitting in the wrong seats, and were in fact in the passenger seats. Good thing the automated systems were working just fine then, eh? We're orbiting about 5 kilometers higher than the target object. So over the next 3 to 4 orbits, it actually starts to catch up on us. You can see it as a dot there that's coming towards us very, very slowly. And uh, at some point there, it starts, to, uh, it starts to actually give us the navigation marker. So we, of course, spend a bit of time optimizing a return or optimizing an intercept 
making the relevant burns to make sure that we actually get in co close. There, three, three meters per second is all it's going to take to move our close approach from uh, 20 kilometers to 0.7. We're just doing that with the RCS thrusters. And now watch as it comes over and we start to fall towards the object. And there, watch how long this thing pauses for as it loads the interplanetary <laughs> craft. Uh, yeah, it is, it's getting kind of painful, this thing. It's getting pretty large and complicated. But never mind, because it is going to be utterly epic when it finally gets going. So just uh, using the lateral thrusters on the RCS to make sure that we're headed straight towards our target. This is going to go on the front there, but it's not going to be the the final part there's going to be one more part which is going to be the lander that's going to sit on in front of this it's unfortunately going to have to face backwards but uh we're just going to get this on here of course it's as far away as possible from that uh nuclear reactor at the back idea being of course to keep the crew as safe as possible from the ionizing radiation so that they come back with the same number of heads that they left with Kerbals certainly have a reputation for being daring and uh, enjoying taking risks, but I suspect that's only when combined with uh, actual entertaining, exciting moments. Having your DNA slowly getting broken apart by subatomic tra particles traveling close to the speed of light doesn't actually sound very fun. It's not exactly a white knuckle ride as you get slowly radiation poisoned to death. No, you want to see death coming at you really quickly like the ground and then turn at the last minute. Cheat death and uh, enjoy yourself in the process. And there we are docked after a short speech. Yeah, this thing is starting to look pretty darn beautiful. Look, let the sun rise here. Notice all the new struts here and the whole thing. I can't wait to get this thing finished. Anyway, uh, speaking of finishing things, we return to the moon. We have one last biome to visit here. It's over on the other side of this large crater. We're actually going to pass over the site. If you remember where uh, Sean Kerman had his uh, problem, where he had to be rescued, we're going to fly pretty much right over that spot. Maybe we'll get a look at what he was actually doing down there, huh? With his secret mission and all that. Ooh! Now wait a second, what's that I see there? Unknown debris? That's not on any of the charts, whatever could it be? Let's go and investigate. Okay, so what this is, well I have an idea of what this is. This is part of the story, remember how we're talking about Sean's secret mission? Lambert, Kerman, whatever happened to him? Well we're going to do a little exercise in interactive storytelling. I'd like you, uh, the audience, to come up with some suggestions for what you think it should be, what you think it might be. Is it about Sean's secret mission? Is it a clue to the fate of Lanberg Kerman? Is it aliens? Is it just a glitch in the system? Whatever it is, the crew of the Outland will be there on the scene to investigate. Perhaps a new plot will straight spring from this. Perhaps new science, perhaps new technology, but most importantly, it's going to be you guys deciding. I might even throw out some free games if there's some really good suggestions. But now here we are landing a few hundred meters away. We can see some sort of strange artificial construct and some debris sitting around it. We can't quite make out what it is at this distance. Of course, right now, Rusty has one thing on his mind, and that is landing the Outlander safely on the surface so that investigation can happen. He perhaps feels that he's being watched, scrutinized perhaps by thousands of pairs of eyes. But he puts those irrational thoughts out of his mind, knowing that the best way to find out is to simply investigate. Perhaps watch a future episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.